What's up guys, I'm Sai High. I want to share this deck that I used to get to Mythic this month, November. It's a very straightforward, uh, best of one historic deck that I've tuned just for best of one specifically for absolutely fast, quick, decisive wins. So if that's your sort of thing, you'll definitely like this deck. I certainly do. It's great for just grinding quickly to Mythic, um, where you just want to make a fast run and then maybe switch to best of three, play more interesting games with a sideboard. Um, but for best of one, this is a great choice. Um, it's really just a mono white thopter artifact aggro deck, whatever you want to call it. I don't really know if there's been a consensus reached on like exactly what to call these decks. You know, it's sort of like affinity, robots, thopter bully. You've seen a lot of different names. If you have a good name or if a consensus has been reached on what to call this, let me know in the comments. But you may have seen this deck or be familiar with it already. Kind of the Boros version we see a lot more often. Uh, probably because it was popularized by Ulf, uh, where he talked about the deck and got a number one uh, finish with it, uh, getting up to number one on the ladder with it, where he used cards like Yosha Declares War and uh, other things like you know from Red uh, to make Thopters. But in this build, I've gone specifically just with pure white, uh, perfect clean mana base, um, much more straightforward. We don't have Yosha Declares War, which is a powerful card for Thopters, but we do have some other bangers in here, which I'll show you. So without further ado, let's dive into the deck. I'll go through every card choice and why I believe it's great uh, for this build. Try to justify it, uh, but let me know what you think, as always, in the comments. But so right off the bat, we've got Luris. What, what, nothing really to say. It's just one of the, maybe, you know, the best, uh, companion there is it's awesome in this deck specifically um, because we can reanimate almost everything pretty much in the deck uh, we can reanimate um, to great effect um, but specifically uh, we should talk about the engine first of like why this deck is so powerful it really hinges around the card retrofitter foundry which can create servo artifacts it can create thopters and it can also sacrifice thopters to create a 4-4 colorless construct artifact creature token on the spot. So naturally, what you do is, typically on the first turn, um, a great start is to have a retrofitter foundry, as well as an ornithopter, which of course uh, has no casting cost. So effectively on the first turn, often in our opponent's end step, we can sack um, the ornithopter to the retrofitter foundry, make a 4-4 colorless construct artifact creature on the first turn, and that's about as powerful as a creature as you can put on the board in turn one. I can't offhand think of a bigger creature you can make on turn one, at least like not conventionally, maybe some some crazy combo I don't know about. Again, let me know if I'm missing something, but making a 4-4 four four on the turn one is about as strong of a creature as you can possibly create. I believe it is the strongest creature you could put out on the first turn in Historic. Um, but again, at least conventionally. So that's a really powerful interaction. So with Retrofitter Foundry, oftentimes um, you'll be, of course, making Thopters, or I'm sorry, making the Constructs by sacrificing the, th the Thopters is what you want to be doing. But it's also just a great grinding card if the game kind of gums up, stalls out a little bit. You can always just keep creating these Servo Artifact Creature Tokens, and they can ultimately be sacked to create Flying Creatures, which may be important specifically in the metagame against elves. They don't have many creatures with reach, so they can't deal with flyers very well. So there are some times where you actually don't want to sacrifice your Thopter um, or your Ornithopter and instead keep it and buff it and fly over the top of all their creatures and win. So Retrofitter Foundry is really versatile in that way. Um, sometimes there's just some tension of you have to decide you know, make a game decision, Do you, is, is having a flying creature more important or having just a beefier, larger creature more important? And it also untaps as well, so it doesn't come up too often in, uh, you know, a deck like this where it's just so straightforward and, and aggressive and fast. However, it, it is still a mana sink, you know, in a long game. If, if it actually does get that long, you can start pumping mana into this thing and creating um, excess tokens. Um, so this is awesome. Again, it reanimates from Lurus, as pretty much everything in the deck does. Um, going through, we already talked about the Ornithopter, obviously, is fuel for the Foundry. Esper Sentinel, just another bomb. Uh, crippling taxing card against many decks, especially decks uh, like Wizards, which wants to cantrip a lot. They've got to prioritize killing this, which is not 
necessarily what they want to do, but it, it's just so backbreaking. It can offer so many cards to you that it's too dangerous for them to leave on the battlefield too uh, for too long. It'll just become too problematic and generate too much value. And of course, there's an artifact as well, so it fits in with the theme of this deck where we're just, we want to put as many artifacts into play as possible. And we're not trying to do anything anything complicated here. It's just trying to make big, huge creatures as fast as possible, swing in for lethal as aggressively as we possibly can. And we have tons of versatile, potent threats um, that can help us get, the, get us there, like Esper Sentinel. So moving on, we got Portable Hole. Again, just another one drop. Uh, obviously, this card is like not good um, against certain matchups with high casting costs. Uh, cards like Control, there's not going to be necessarily a lot of targets, but Control is probably our worst matchup anyways. Um, a card like um, Divine Purge is pretty much backbreaking as it exiles like our entire board and just makes it uh, so slow and difficult to get back into the game. However, Portable Hole, when it is good, it's absolutely awesome. And one of the most popular decks in the format is Wizards right now, another extremely um, you know, powerful deck like this. But Portable Hole is awesome in that matchup. We can remove their potent threats, um, particularly the uh, Arcanist um, is what you're going to want to look to remove, although all of their targets are pretty much juicy targets and, and good targets to hit. But Dreadhorde Arcanist is particularly problematic. We don't want them to get their engine online where they're starting to reanimate you know, lightning bolt effects and killing all, of our, all, killing all of our creatures by recasting stuff from the graveyard. That's no good. So Portable Hole is awesome in just removing really potent threats like Arcanist and many others, um, as well as in the mirror match. And of course, it's an artifact as well. So it, uh, you know, it, it expands our game plan of just being artifact rich and heavy and wanting to saturate and get a, as many artifacts on the board as we can. Moving on, we got Toolcraft Exemplar. Another extremely powerful one drop, um, you know, on rate. Uh, when you have artifacts in play, this will become a 3-2. If you have up to three artifacts, it'll actually gain first strike as well. Not a good blocker, but we don't really want to get into blocking if we can help it with this deck anyways. We want to be attacking and killing as fast as possible. So a 3-2 first striker for one mana is about as good a rate as you possibly can. You know, a 3-3 for one is incredible. And that's why, like I said, I was talking about earlier, having a 4-4 construct for basically one mana on turn one is about as good as it possibly gets. And that's another just really powerful thing against Wizards. No doubt that's maybe the most powerful deck in the format. Um, one of them most powerful anyway. But our matchup is decent versus them. You know, they, if you have a, a opening hand with a foundry and you can start making construct, uh, constructs early, they really can't deal with that. It's difficult for them to deal with a 4-4. They have to spend a lot of resources to chop that down. And if we can make it even bigger, uh, we can go over the top of them and kill them with just larger creatures. So Toolcraft Exemplar, very good, potent one drop. Moving on, I've got one copy of Hope of Jira per, however you pronounce that, probably butchering it. But just another 1-1 one, one flyer for one. Not Nothing too special here. However, it is another Thopter target. That's important. So it's just more fuel and fodder to um, actually make this Retrofitter Foundry combo possible uh, by having more Thopters to sacrifice. Um, in addition, um, if you don't sacrifice it, it's another flyer, another flying threat. So it can be very good against like elves, like I was saying earlier, to buff it and go over the top and kill them with it. It does have the ability as well, if you manage to hit your opponent with this, uh, you can sacrifice it and kind of silence your opponent or make it so they can't uh, cast a non-creature spell until your next turn. So uh, it hasn't been super relevant for me yet. Most of the time it's been more valuable to keep um, this card on the battlefield. Against control though, it could potentially help you know stop a wrath or a board sweep effect, but Moreover, the main reason this is in here is just one additional Thopter, and it's legendary, so I'm not going to run more than one copy of it. Already talked about the Foundry at length. Two Shadow Spears. This is pretty much par for the course for these Thopter artifact decks these days. This equipment is, you know, not a lot of equipment sees play, but the equipment that does see play is often Shadow Spear, just because it's so strong, it even sees play in modern, you know, hammer decks, um, things like that. Just so powerful to give a creature trample, um, especially because we can't really 
go wide so much in this deck, but we can build massive, huge creatures. So having Trample is really important, um, as well as Life Link is also important, especially against um, you know mono red aggro decks. Uh, if we get a big enough creature with Life Link, that's game over for them. So Shadow Spear again, also an artifact, uh, just a really strong equipment um, to buff our creatures further. Does have another ability not to be forgotten. Uh, where permanents your opponent's control lose hexproof and indestructible until end of turn by activating it for one colorless. Very strange, unique ability. Uh, doesn't come up too often, but it is relevant. There are things with you know indestructible like Hiliad that you'll encounter in historic, and there are some you know weird, weird circumstances where actually surprising your opponent if they you know just forget that this ability exists. Um, you can get them and actually kill something that you otherwise couldn't kill. So don't forget uh, about that ability that Shadow Spear has. Don't sleep on it. It does come up from time to time. Moving on to one of the more unique cards that I've added. I'm a big fan of all that glitters. You know, it's kind of a high risk but high reward. You know, in best of one environments, um, it's I find it so helpful to just be able to blow people out and have just very linear, powerful, quick strategies. So obviously all that glitters, being an aura... Um, you know, it's it's not great. We would rather it be an artifact, but it, it uh, cares about the number of artifacts and enchantments in play and buffs our creature accordingly based on how many are in play. Um, so it's been a favorite of mine in auras, but it's a favorite of mine here as well. Um, oftentimes, you get this um, on a creature and you can just swing for lethal in one to two turns. It's going to be so large. Um, as well as against, uh, like I was talking about earlier, mono red aggro decks. If you can get them into a position where they're tapped out, or maybe you've uh, already baited out all of their removal, you know, stomps, uh, lightning bolt effects, whatever, and you can get a creature large enough, um, you know, kind of over that critical four toughness area um, where they, they can't even spend two, you know, bolt effects to kill it. You get something up in the six, seven, seven range. One, then it, the the Scott, you know, it's just the game is yours at that point because red uh, can only really kill creatures by dealing damage to them. If you get it out of range of their damage spells, um, they they just can't deal with it. So, and all the glitters on a creature um, is often just game over for red decks, especially on the play because they they just can't deal with a creature once it becomes that large. And like I was talking about earlier with the Shadow Spear, if you get a Shadow Spear on there, it's just, uh, it's even more more problematic for them, especially against a red aggro deck where lifelink is going to matter. And all the glitters just, just kills people so quickly. It's so aggressive in a deck like this. Obviously, like I was saying, though, it's an aura, so you could get burnt out by it. You get two for one. But in best of one scenario, we're, we're going all in. We're, we just want to win games as fast as possible. And like I said, I really like this deck for, like, grinding um, like if you're just trying to get your 10, 15 wins for the day or whatever, you don't necessarily want to get in some, you know, grindy control versus control matchup. It might just be good to just win as many as fast as you can, frankly, during the day, just to get your quests and generate your gold for the day, um, if that's what you're going for. But uh, moreover, again, like just to grind to mythic as fast as possible every season. This deck is a great choice, and I, I got to Mythic without... I don't know what my record was. Um, I didn't track it this time, but it felt really fast. Like, I got got there without having to play much because um, the games were winning a lot, but also not just winning good percentage, but just winning so quickly with a deck like this. So, highly recommend it. Uh, moving on, Barb Spike. A little bit of a weird one here. Maybe the weakest card of the deck, actually, but it is an important role. So, it's another equipment... Um, we get to put two artifacts on the board with just one card, which is good. More material, more artifacts, uh, has great synergy with all these cards that ma uh, care about how many artifacts are in play, like I was just talking about the all the glitters that we just talked about. Uh, so Barb Spike, just putting in a Thopter. Uh, more, again, it's a Thopter, so it is uh, synergy with the Foundry to sacrifice it. But the flying does matter as well. Um, there are some times, like I was saying, where you actually don't want to sacrifice it and make a Construct. Or sometimes you'll be sacrificing something after blocking as just fodder um, and then getting the value um, from the construct where you sacrifice the Thopter that was going to die anyways. But Barb Spike, just another way to make Thopters and flying creatures. And uh, there are times where you have to value the flyer more than the construct and you maybe don't want to sacrifice it. So 
If you see a window where you can win by having a flying creature, be wary about sacrificing this. You know, keep the flyer around because it's often a way to beat elves on the spot because they can't block the flyer. Because like I was saying, they they just only they only have a one or two creatures with reach, I think, in their deck. So most of the time, you can just get through. Moving on to another very popular card in these artifact-rich archetypes, uh, Ingenious Smith. Awesome card for white. That's why I'm, another reason why we're, we are in mono white for this artifact Thopter bully style deck. Uh, Ingenious Smith, very good. Uh, one white, one colorless, one one. We get to reveal the top four. Pick an artifact uh, from the top of our deck. Get value that way, and then um, that's already solid and good. But then early every time we drop an artifact, this is getting a plus one plus one counter um, once per turn. That's Interesting, and this has even more synergy with things like the Foundry, um, where if we can make an artifact on our opponent's turn, you know, conventionally and traditionally we can't do that um, with spells, but with sac effects and things that put artifacts into play at instant speed, we can make sure that we sacrifice our Thopters to put constructs uh, into play on our opponent's turn so that we can continue to further grow the Ingenious Smith on our opponent's turn. You can also surprise, um, you know, lesser skilled players as well that aren't necessarily expecting that, where you, you, you know, block and you make an artifact, buffing this guy uh, by, you know, plus one, plus one, and can win in combat. Um, in addition to the Foundry, we have other ways of making artifacts at instant speed, which we'll get to in a moment once we cover the lands, but we just have to cover the final banger of a card in Michiko's Reign of Truth. Um, just an awesome saga. I felt like this was slept on for a while, but very similar to all that glitters and that we're every once per turn, um, rather rather than a, than a permanent effect with all the glitters, but once per turn, um, including the turn we drop this, we're buffing a creature um, by plus one plus one equal to the number of artifacts and or enchantments we control. So just a massive buff again with this and all the glitters. Um, and then the difference, of course, being that this will turn into a creature um, after it's gone through all its chapters. And it doesn't buff the creatures during your opponent's turn like all the glitters does, where all the glitters can be awesome against mono red decks um, because they just can't kill the creature once it gets too large. But Michiko's Reign of Truth, again, very similar. Just a fast, aggressive buffing card. And we have so many targets for it that fly. Um, we can make a massive artifact creature very quickly. And then, of course, when all the chapters are done, it comes into play as its own creature, the Portrait of Michiko, and it is power toughness equal to the number of artifacts and enchantments we have in play. So it's going to be a big creature for sure. Moving on to the mana base. I love monocolor decks. Very simple here. We're just 17 planes, one legendary land from Kamigawa, of course. Seed of the Empire. Uh, just, just good, you know, there's no opportunity, there's very little opportunity cost to play this, it's basically just for free, so we jam one in there, but more interestingly, let's talk about the treasure vaults, why do I have treasure vault in here, particularly, uh, oftentimes you'll see Darksteel Citadel as the artifact land in these, uh, artifact decks, and that makes a lot of sense, um, you know, an indestructible artifact land, uh, first and foremost, you just <clears throat> you're running an artifact land just to buff your artifact count, of course. But then it comes down to which ones do you want to run. Well, Darksteel Citadel makes a lot of sense when you have blue, and you might have something like Insole Artifact, um, or that Yosha declares war for red, which can animate an artifact. But we don't have any way to animate artifacts in this deck. We have ways to buff them, but no way to animate them. So for that reason, I feel Treasure Vault is slightly better than Darksteel Citadel, just because it has the other ability of XX Sacrifice Treasure Vault to create X Treasure Tokens. Now, this doesn't come up often, don't get me wrong. However, it is possible to create, turn this one Treasure Vault artifact into two artifacts. Or, in extreme cases, you know, with if you have seven mana in play, it could turn this into three artifacts to further buff things like the Reign of Truth and the all the glitters that we talked about earlier. It's just to get as much material out there as possible. Additionally, um, in, you know, we, so this got the one thing good, good for it of multiplying your material, multiplying your artifacts in play. But in addition to that, you can do this at instant speed. 
So like I was talking about earlier, when you can catch some lesser skilled players uh, by surprise by making artifacts at instant speed, this is another way to do that. In addition to the Foundry with Treasure Vault, we can do that as well. We can, uh, during our opponent's turn, for example, just create some treasure tokens, which can trigger our ingenious smith and push uh, push up the amount of damage we can do that way. So a little bit of a cute kind of interesting card. I'm um, not going crazy four copies on them because, again, it does only produce colorless and we need uh, white mana for this deck. But it's also important to have a few of these artifact lands because there are situations where um, maybe you led with Toolcraft Exemplar and the next turn uh, maybe you're going to play Ingenious Smith. So you're not going to get that important artifact to buff this guy up to three because Ingenious Smith is not an artifact. Um, so on turn two, but with a thing like a Treasure Vault, and similarly with a Dark Steel Citadel, you know, your second land could be Treasure Vault. Uh, thus, you've satisf satisfied the artifact requirement for Toolcraft Exemplar to hit for three on turn two, even in situations where the second turn you didn't play another artifact. Um, or your first artifact, um, where if you have a you have a bit of a stranger hand and you're you're forced to play Smith on turn two or Reign of Truth on turn two, which you generally don't want to have to do if you can help it. You want to try to increase your artifact count early, but in those strange spots where you are going to lead or uh, second turn go Smith, it's just good to have that extra artifact just to buff the Toolcraft Exemplar. And again, just more more artifact count to get up to the th and. Cr uh, the crucial three artifact count threshold and as well as just the more artifacts the merrier again just to buff these effects as much as possible so it's a really powerful straightforward awesome deck for best of one totally could adapt this to best of three with important cyborg cards like hushbringer which can shut down a lot of things um you know we use hearse other artifact uh, cards that can negate certain strategies is how I would build a sideboard for this but we can talk about that another time because really covered all the basics of this deck and I, like I said I've configured this specifically for just best of one absolute fast mythic run beat down and then once you get to mythic you can continue to play it or if you find best of three more interesting which it arguably is you can switch to uh, a deck that's more tuned for best of three maybe a little bit more balanced and uh, more um, you know, more of a fleshed out sideboard where you can prepare for anything. But hope you like this deck. Let me know what you think of it. As always, comment, subscribe, all the generic YouTube uh, BS. I appreciate everyone that's watched to the end. And until next time, guys, good luck on the ladder and peace.